You should get one of those like mounts. I have one. I just never remember to get it out of the car. <laughs> I know. So anyway, um, third and final lecture of the quiz two period. We'll talk about the development of the sex symbolism. Uh, that is the development of the, the splitting, I guess, of the United States into two distinct geographical sections with competing interests, economically and politically. And those competing interests are going to manifest themselves as America grows into what we'll call the Western territories. Um, we've already seen America grow into the old Northwest with the Northwest Ordinance and what we call the Midwest or Great Lakes region. And we've seen that slavery was banned by the Northwest Ordinance and that uh, along with the Indian removal and the settlement of the Cotton Kingdom where slavery was allowed to expand, uh, we now have two sort of paradigms, two examples of what might happen as America grew into new territory. And of course we have the Louisiana Purchase, which still has to be settled. And during this lecture here, we'll deal with some of that, particularly with the settling of Missouri at the <laughs> onset. And if we get into the 1840s and 1850s, as we will, America will acquire all of this, Texas, and then what we call the Mexican Cession an enormous portion of land signed over by the Mexican government at the end of the Mexican-American War that includes really the entirety of the American Southwest. It's, it's all of the, the states, if you look at state names and the original 13, most of those are um, English or Latin for English, like Virginia for the Virgin Queen, Maryland for Queen Mary, Carolus for King Charles, Carolus is Latin for Charles. Florida being the exception because it was named by Spanish explorers. Um, and then most of the other state names in the interior are Indian names of one way or another, but all these out here are Spanish names, California, Nevada, New Mexico, Colorado, um, Utah being the exception. But my, my point in Arizona is uh, this is a very, very large portion of land and you're gonna have to really quickly determine what's going to happen there and the two sections are at odds with over this number one question, will slavery be allowed to expand there or not? That's the key question of this whole lecture. Can slavery expand into America's Western territories or not? This is just review from last time where the four factors that converged um, during the Jackson administration and after in the 1830s to give rise to the Cotton Kingdom, those four factors were obviously Indian removal, the forcible removal of the Cherokee Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw into a, a climate and an area where the soil with that climate, the Black Belt, was perfect for growing long staple cotton. And at a time, where you have the invention of the cotton gin, factor three, that made cotton, uh, it made it more efficient to separate cotton fiber from seed and stem. So a technological factor. And then an economic factor, the beginning of the industrial revolution in England and in the Northern American states means textile production is occurring in factories. They're using new looms and new sources of power to produce cotton textiles at an incredibly high rate, and there is then this great demand for cotton. So an economic condition that is an uptick in demand due to the Industrial Revolution. And so people flood into the deep south from Alabama down through Louisiana, and they bring with them slaves, or if they don't, they simply go to slave markets where slave owners from the older slave labor areas like the Chesapeake and the tobacco region and the low country rice region have seen their markets decline and they're selling off some of their slaves who could end up at markets in Tuscaloosa and Jackson or in New Orleans and people could go there and acquire enslaved human beings to help them grow in this case cotton which becomes America's most valuable 
export during this time, surpassing rice. That being said, uh, this is a chattel slave system, and slaves themselves remain the most valuable commodity in America. And those slave markets that we just talked about are a, 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 a place that you could go to sort of understand just one example of what it means for the Deep South to be a slave society, as historians call it. And not just a society with slaves, as had been the case in, say, the Northern colonies before they abolished slavery. Um, imagine the sort of average yeoman farmer, somebody who's not a poor wandering laborer, but does own land, but you know is not really rich, doesn't own slaves. He might save up his money and one day go to that slave market and acquire a slave. Or maybe two, or maybe a family of slaves, and he has now attained that status in society of a master, of a slave owner. He has risen up the social ladder in that way. Or imagine, and this is the, the average slave owner was like that, only owned a few slaves. But imagine that person wanting to, at some point in their life, go to the slave market, acquire a few more, and then maybe attain the status of planter. Like if you had 10, 12 slaves, you were considered not just a slave-owning farmer, but a planter. In doing so, then that person has risen up the ladder. Or imagine planters who had a dozen slaves, but one day thought, you know, I want to have a slave empire to bequeath to my son. I want to be like those um, planters they talked about down in the low country that have like 300 slaves on their plantation. And they don't even live there. They live in Charleston and they have overseers do all the work and they live a life of incredible luxury. That's what I want when I go to the slave market to acquire more and more and more. Think about this. Number one, these men, and sometimes women too, white women, uh, are imagining who they can be in society by imagining quite literally who they could buy. So to put it another way, social mobility is tied to your ownership in human beings as chattel slaves. That's just an example of what it means when we're talking about a slave society. But would that slave society begin to, or be able to, I should say, continue to expand or not? For we have sectionalism now, which we said was simply America developing into two distinct geographical sections with their own competing interests, you might say, and um, competing visions. You might also say, at a time where people spoke of America's manifest destiny. What's that mean? It's our destiny to go from sea to sea and colonize the whole country because we, that's God's gift to us. Yeah, that job is what you were going to say. Yeah, it's this idea that it is America's destiny, it is, you know, Written, written in, in the books uh, that America, with God's assistance, will stretch one day from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. America will one day, as you say, colonize all of that area. They'll be all part of it. You have an America that stretches, as you say, from sea to sea. Sea to shining sea. Well, of course, yes. And what's the what's our patriotic song? The Redwood, something about the Redwood Forest and the... the uh, God bless America. Is it in there? I don't know. It's in one of them. I don't yeah. know. You mean this land is your land? Maybe that's it. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. what that's what those lyrics are. Okay. From. Well, <laughs> so our, our, one of those jingoistic, as we would say, songs, the rah rah America song. So, um, but uh, people in positions of power uh, in, in the North have different ideas about what that should look like as America fulfills its manifest destiny and actually grows into and settles the West versus people in positions of power and wealth in the South. In the South, uh, those planters, those rich planters, envisioned slavery expanding into the West. Some of them thought it was necessary for the preservation of that society that slavery must continue to expand rather than be, as they would say, restricted. 
and they want to see America growing into the West as a slave-holding agrarian republic, using primarily slave labor to produce cash crops. In the North, however, where the Industrial Revolution had taken hold, those people envision an America growing with diversity in terms of economics and economic output, so continuing industrialization, manufacturing, uh, free labor as opposed to slave labor. And not just in America that is confined to agrarian cash crop production and a, in, a, in a world that favors wealthy people who are able to acquire slave labor. That would then set an unfair advantage to them as opposed to the average American wage earning worker at a time of industrialization. Now, are you good with that? Questions? Comments? If I make nothing else crystal clear in the first half of this lecture, I would prefer for this to be the number one clearest thing. You know, we've generally in American history had two major parties. It has changed over time as to what they were, not very often. Uh, we have just seen the creation of a political party that we is still around today. Before we finish today, we'll have the other one. But um, in opposition to the Democrats, the Whig Party was formed. So this is Andrew Jackson's Democratic Party. The party that coalesces in opposition against them is the Whig Party. And at this moment, these are the two major ones. But here's the point that I wanted to make abundantly clear. These are not sectional parties. This is not, one is the party of the South and one is the party of the North. That does not exist yet. These are both national parties and they are what is politically holding the nation together. They are like the cords binding America together North and South because they are both national in nature and not sectional. In other words, there are Northern Whigs and there are Southern Whigs. There are Northern Democrats and there are Southern Democrats. To illustrate this point, and I finally got a laser pointer in here and I'm using it to prop up my video from my online people. I need to just bring another one um, or anything else to prop up the phone. But uh, look at this, this is a map uh, demonstrating the uh, electoral college vote uh, results in the 1844 presidential election. As you can see, the Democratic candidate, James K. Polk, who won the election, um, wins you know, some states of the Deep South, from South Carolina to Louisiana, but he also wins Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Pennsylvania, New York, Maine, northern and southern states that he won. Henry Clay, the Whig Party candidate, who is a slave-owning planter from Kentucky, wins his home state, also Tennessee and North Carolina, but then loses all the other southern states and wins Ohio and New Jersey and Vermont and Massachusetts. So there's not here one party or one candidate south or north. Now, what we're gonna see today is what happens when these parties either break up forever or begin to break apart and then in their place, we have an actual sectional party. And okay, what if that party has actual real uh, political power? Am I right, clear on that? Yes. Um, I just have a question. Yeah. Um, the one uh, down with power, was it into the, the south? Yes. So yeah, let me get to that since I do see, I, I probably put that in the wrong place in, in the bullet points. Um, let's do talk about the balance of power. There were times, typically on two kinds of things, there were times when things would come before Congress like issues of economics or trade. And then of course the direct issue of the possibility of slavery expanding into some new Western territory. When issues like that came up, people would break with their party and vote with their section. And so certain issues would come up like a major tariff package that would be great for industry, but maybe not so great for American agriculture if other countries would retaliate. 
Southern Whigs and Southern Democrats vote together against it, and Northern Whigs and Northern uh, Democrats vote together you know, for it. Does that make sense? There are times you would break with your party and vote with your section. And at that time, there was a rough balance of power in Congress in terms of section. There's a roughly equal number of representatives in the House and senators in the Senate from the North and from the South. It's about even. And that's good because if it were skewed one way or the other, one section could outvote the other section with a bi-party coalition every time. Does that make sense? And so there's going to be, as we walk through this, a real interest in maintaining that balance of power and not letting it get too far in favor of one section or the other. So, the Missouri Compromise. What happens when, in 1820, enough people have finally begun to settle in the Louisiana Purchase Territory on the western banks of the Mississippi River and up and down both banks of the Missouri River, such that Missouri is ready to be added to the United States as a new state. It has a lot of people who migrated from Kentucky, Tennessee, Arkansas, Mississippi. They're slave owners who brought slaves with them. So it would be beneficial, it would make sense if Missouri joined the American Union as a new slave state. But we had its balance of power though. But what could you do if you had a slave state to maintain the balance of power? Add a free state. And it just so happens that up here, um, all of this land that's the very northeastern tip of America was nominally, technically part of the state of Massachusetts. It had just become disjointed with the addition of Vermont and New Hampshire. And so it would make sense to say, well, let's just make that Maine a, a state in and to itself. Obviously, it's going to be a free state. It's way up there where, you know, part of Massachusetts already abolished slavery, so it would make sense. That way, yeah, you got two new senators and some representatives from Missouri, a slave state, but you have the same thing from Maine, and we maintain the balance of power, right? That's only one provision of the Louisiana Purchase, though. And the second one, for our purposes, is of more importance. The second provision provides for that red line you see at the top in that top map. It says 36, 30 degrees. That's a reference to that line of latitude on the map. That's an extension of the border, the southern border of Missouri, west to what was at that time the western boundary of the United States of America. Everything else you see past there was still controlled by Spain, which pretty soon is going to lose control of that in a revolution, and it will become Mexico. But point being, it's not America yet. What's the significance of the lie? The Missouri Compromise says, with the obvious exception of Missouri that just came in as a slave state, nothing else above this line will be slave. If and when America ever were to take the army and subdue the various Native American groups that control that unorganized territory, the Missouri Compromise says those will become free territories and free states, not slave, and will maintain the rough north-south divide that we've had going back all the way to the Mason-Dixon line that separates Pennsylvania from Maryland. Make sense? So no slavery above 3630 with the exception of Missouri. That, that compromise, that element of that compromise is going to hold for 30 years. And when it doesn't is when things start to really escalate. But first... Before that becomes an issue, we have this acquisition of a massive amount of land from Mexico. Uh, the origins about how that comes to be lie with the creation of the Republic of Texas. Texas was part of the brand new nation state of Mexico, which obtained its independence from Spain. But this portion over here, especially the fertile um, grasslands and extension maybe of the Black Belt in, in East Texas, where all today the big cities are like Dallas and Houston, 
San Antonio, Austin, uh, all over here in East Texas. Um, that area was settled by a lot of white Anglo planters and farmers or ranchers who had come from um, America. And they ended up having beef or uh, issues with the new Mexican government. The solution for them to which was to rise up in revolution and to break away from Mexico, which after a time they do. And Texas becomes, briefly at least, its own independent country, the Republic of Texas. Not for long, however, uh, the leaders of that movement, some of them had all along had an eye towards petitioning America to become a state in America. And once that process is initiated, there is strong disagreement between the American government and the Mexican government over where is the border. What exactly did these Tejano revolutionaries get when they obtained their independence? According to Mexico, it's only this. According to the Tejanos in the United States, it's all of that, all the way to the Rio Grande. So everything that's, you got a line, blue line there on it, is disputed territory. Both sides send troops to kind of flex muscle, shocker, they end up shooting at each other, and now we have a war on our hands. Um, there's a, obviously quite a lot of fighting in that disputed area, and up here in North Mexico around Monterey, long and, and interesting story short though, America uses its naval power to sail down to the south um, near Veracruz and to um, launch an expedition there, the end result of which will be an occupation of Mexico City. At which time the United States forces Mexico to sign away or cede all of the not only disputed territory of Texas, but all of that. Everything we were talking about early on that constitutes essentially the entire southwest of the United States going all the way through California. That all clear? So that, that all that land is known as the Mexican Session because it was ceded away. So with the Louisiana Purchase, we're in the 1840s now. That was purchased during Jefferson's administration in the early 1800s, and it's, most of it remained unsettled, right? So why is it, might you guess, that unlike in that case here, with the Mexican Session, particularly when it came to California, that almost immediately, within a couple of years, people are flocking out there to settle. No sooner does America acquire this land than gold is discovered in California. And people rush out there in 1848, 1849, the so-called 49ers are rushing out to San Francisco, which was the main city along the California coast there in the vicinity of mountains where you could go and prospect and hopefully strike it rich by acquiring a parcel of land that maybe had a bunch of gold or maybe silver. So almost immediately uh, you see people flocking out there, by the way, dispossessing the Mexican people who live there of their land in the process. Um, and, and the other answer to the question other than gold rush is a lot of that land had been um, settled already by uh, the Mexican people who lived there under the Mexican government and who were pushed off of their land. And these are not, um, this is not like the northern part of Louisiana Purchase where it's all controlled by Native Americans. They had already been settled. And now those people will see themselves dispossessed of their land. Um, but yeah, the answer, the other part of the answer is Native Americans had already been uh, forced out of some of these areas, unlike with the northern parts of Louisiana Purchase. But, what about this debate then becomes, what are we going to do with this Mexican session in terms of the expansion of slavery? Because now, you know, it's almost immediately California is going to have to come into the United States. With Texas coming in, a lot of those ranchers were slave owners. It made sense for Texas to come in as slave. Some of the Louisiana Purchase territory up near the Midwestern states was beginning to be turned into free states. So it made sense to bounce that power that way. 
What are we going to do with California? And by the way, what do we do with the rest of the Mexican session? Some people said, why don't you just extend the Missouri Compromise line and say, okay, slavery can expand down here in the south, but not above that line. Seem perfectly reasonable. It's not what happens. <laughs> For there were some people who argued that slavery should be banned from the whole thing, just like with the Northwest Ordinance. And these people, by the way, are not abolitionists. Um, these people are, well, what become known as free soilers. With their slogan being, uh, free soil, free labor, free men. These are people who don't care about slavery per se. They, they don't care about slavery in the South. They certainly don't care about slaves or black people. Their concern is free white laborers. And if slavery were allowed to expand into California or into this Mexican session generally, they felt like if the average white American wage worker or farmer were to move out there, that the very presence of slave labor, number one, would devalue their free labor. And that two, it would just make it harder for small farmers and white wage earners to compete with these rich planters. So it's unfair, they say, to the average white wage worker or farmer to allow these filthy rich planters to go there with their slave labor, which they said maybe could be used in factories and not just in cash crop production, which would ruin the labor market for white wage workers who want to work in those factories. Well, they don't win the day either. Nor does John C. Calhoun, but I want you to pay real close attention to his argument here because it's going to come back in a few years and in a big way. Calhoun uh, makes the opposite argument of the free soilers and said, well, no, in my thinking, slavery should be allowed in, in the whole thing. And so his rationale is that these bans on slavery in, in Western territories like this are actually a violation of his constitutional rights. And he points to the 15th Amendment, which says, in part, the federal government, and they channel lock directly here, the federal government can't deprive you of your life, liberty, or property without the D-U-E, due process of law. Meaning, unless you of uh, been convicted of a crime by a jury of your peers. Unless you have been sued by someone and lost, then the federal government can't take your life, your freedom, or your stuff. There is a legal process, in other words, to which you are due or entitled to have that play out before the federal government can have any role in your freedom, your life, or your stuff being taken, right? What does that have to do with this? What's the point Calhoun is about to make? He's saying you can't take my slaves and I own them. Chattel slavery means slaves are property that belongs to me. And if I want to move to California and you've done what the free soilers say and ban slavery, isn't that depriving me of my property without the due process of law? And I told you, he doesn't win either in this case, but remember his argument. Remember the case that he made here. What ultimately wins the day? The, the Compromise of 1850. And make sure to differentiate this from the Missouri Compromise from 30 years earlier. I don't know if you want to highlight them in different colors or whatever, but you know, two distinct compromises. And if you read about this one in your book, there's a lot more to it than I'm going to talk about. So you should know, you know, in here in lecture, what I say is the most important thing, and that's what's ha what happens with the Mexican session. California, as you can see, comes in as free, number one. Number two, the rest of the Mexican session is divided up into two huge territories, Utah and New Mexico, which you, you should make note that that would include what would eventually become not just those two states, but also which other ones? Nevada, Arizona. Nevada, Arizona, Colorado, yes. Yes. 
So a vast amount of territory, and it's in purple because this is the key to the compromise. They are open to popular sovereignty. Those territories would be left open to popular sovereignty. Popular meaning the people who move there and settle there and vote in elections there. Sovereignty is in they have the power to determine the answer to this question. Would those territories become free states or would they become slave states? It's up to the voters. It's up to the people who move there and settle there and have, meet the requirements to vote. They would be able to elect candidates who would draft state constitutions that either would or would not allow slavery. In other words, popular sovereignty takes the federal government out of the equation and puts the power into the hands of the people in the states. That makes sense? Gives both sides hope. Uh, Southerners are thinking, you know, our institution at the heart of our slave society is steadily marched west in the southern portion of this country. Now that's going to continue. Northern people, and, and maybe if any of you have been to, I don't know, like New Mexico, <laughs> they're thinking a lot of desert, a lot of mountains, not really good for cash crop production, probably not going to be like a massive expansion of slavery. So, you know, both sides are thinking maybe this could be a good thing for, for us and our interests in terms of those competing visions for how America will grow. Question. Let me jump back real quick, and this would be under Kansas-Nebraska Act background. So I've mentioned in here a couple of times, America is industrializing. Much of that is happening in the North, East, and the Midwest, but also out in California. Um, and, and we're going to talk about this in after quiz two. Um, it, the backbone of industrialization in terms of infrastructure is the railroad. And America had begun building railroad networks in the Northeast, in the Midwest, to some extent in the South to transport cash crops. And California had begun building a railroad network uh, connecting San Francisco with all these mining towns, right? But they weren't connected with one another. And a key element, some thought, in really fulfilling the Manifest Destiny is having those railroad networks connected, having, in other words, a transcontinental railroad. A railroad that spanned the continent, connected California with the rest of the country. There were many people who could agree on this, north and south. Um, if you're from the south, you can envision you know, sending your cash crops out west in the market that way. The disagreement was, where would it begin over here? Or where, you might say, where would it terminate? What would be its eastern terminus? Everybody could agree that San Francisco made sense as a terminus over here in California. Los Angeles isn't really around yet. San Diego is a very small town. San Francisco is the big city. But down here, Southerners are thinking it's got to be New Orleans, right there, mouth of the Mississippi River. Maybe St. Louis, also on the Mississippi, could transport goods down, whatever. Uh, a lot of northern people, though, favor the city that had become and uh, is rapidly growing as the hub of that Midwest region, Chicago, Illinois. From there, goods could go through the Great Lakes, across the newly built Erie Canal, into the Hudson River, and out into the Atlantic in New York City. Why not Chicago? So, think about this. Um, one answer to that question, why not Chicago, might be... Look at where this railroad would go if it went from San Francisco to Chicago. Right through that unorganized territory, which is a way of saying Indian territory, where there are Native American groups that are very powerful and would take the U.S. Army some time to forcibly subdue them and force them onto reservations before you could think about building a railroad line and maintaining a railroad line through that area. Um, furthermore, if you were to do that, think back to earlier in this lecture, and what's on that map, in fact, who would cry foul if you were going to do that, and why? The South. And why? Because there's no way to get to it without traveling east. There's a, there's a bigger reason why. You're right as to who? Maybe Indians. 
Because there's no flakes on that. Thirty-six thirty ban on slavery going back to the Louisiana Purchase and the Missouri Compromise. Uh, Missouri Compromise said if and when that's ever settled, all that will be free states. So that's a lot of territory. You have the potential for that to become numerous free states and disrupt the balance of power, right? So Southerners are going to be like, absolutely not, no way. Got to leave that as Indian country. Leave that alone. We got this ban on slavery up there. Not cool. So how could this man who we're about to talk about, Stephen Douglas. Stephen Douglas is a senator from Illinois who, in fact, had defeated a young representative in the House, Abraham Lincoln, for that Senate seat. And he was one of the most powerful members of the Democratic Party at the time. How could Stephen Douglas possibly get Southern members of his party, the Democratic Party, and Southern Whigs to possibly agree to an eastern terminus of the Transcontinental Railroad at Chicago in a railroad line running through that territory necessitating the formation of territories that would become states. How could Douglas possibly do that? And he did do that. And the way he did that, if you look at the map, you can see it in the colors by repealing the Missouri Compromise. The Kansas-Nebraska Act expressly repeals or does away with that 3630 ban on slavery in the Louisiana Purchase Territories. He proposes to them, what if we didn't have a Missouri Compromise? Would that ease your mind? And might you then agree to a Chicago rather than a Southern Terminus because you would be so happy at the lifting of that ban? and the potential expansion of slavery north of 3630 into Kansas or perhaps even Nebraska? And the answer is yes. He got broad Southern support for the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which repealed the Missouri Compromise, or did away with the, obviously not the first provision about Missouri and Maine, but that 3630 provision, created two massive territories with Kansas and Nebraska, which... You can see, as with Utah and New Mexico, include what would become multiple states eventually. And unlike before, they could potentially become slave states. It depends on who moves there. It depends on you know, who they vote for and what they decide about whether they're going to be slave or not. And if, if you were to take, and you could do this differently, and there would be people who would disagree with me, but if you wanted to, you had to take one single event and say, you know, more or as much as anything, you could draw a line of cause and effect from this event to the outbreak of the American Civil War. I would argue you have a pretty easy time with this one. It's going to be six plus years before we get there, but it really sets a lot of forces in motion that are really important. So let's talk about the effects and the significance of this. Number one, it's one thing for Stephen Douglas to convince Southern members in his party to vote for this. But he got Southern Whigs to vote for it, too. And the Northern members of that party are outraged at that. Lincoln gives multiple speeches um, furious that members of his party from the South would vote to dismantle a compromise on this that it held for 30 years. I mean, 34 years, to be exact. The ire between Northern and Southern Whigs and their hardening of positions on slavery's expansion causes that party to collapse. That's it. The Whig party is no more. And remember what I said about these national parties and the cords holding the American nation together, North and South. One of them just broke. What about the Democratic Party? Well... Slave owners start rushing into Kansas to purchase land, to settle down, to establish Kansas as a new slave-holding territory that will become a slave state. Um, people who are against slavery's expansion begin to move there or are sponsored by people of wealth to go there for the express purpose of voting for candidates that are anti-slavery's expansion to make sure that this does not happen, Kansas becoming a slave state. 
Many of those people are armed. Uh, they're going to cry voter fraud and foul when the elections are held, and they're going to start killing each other. And in what the press, the newspapers will call bleeding Kansas, a preview of what's to come in six years. You know, a low-grade guerrilla, guerrilla civil war of neighbor on neighbor killing one another in low-grade territorial civil warfare, presaging what we will see later. And by the way, as a result of those um, two sides both claiming at one point to be the legitimate government of the territory of Kansas, they send constitutions for their state to the nation's capital, and Congress has to determine which one's the legitimate one. Southern Democrats support the obviously pro-slavery one. The Northern Democrats support the anti-slavery one. And that party begins to break up over the issue, a result of what's going on in Kansas. Obviously, they end up coming back together, but even the Democratic Party starts to break up. And then finally... Former Northern Whigs decide to form a new coalition. Lincoln and other Northern Whigs who had left that party over Kansas, Nebraska, decided to join with two other groups who had different ideas than they did, but did have one thing in common. First of all, abolitionists. Abraham Lincoln is not an abolitionist. He is on record repeatedly saying slavery in the South is what it is. Um, he simply wanted to keep it from expanding. And in that, of course, he has that in common with abolitionists. Abolitionists want to do away with slavery everywhere. Of course, part and parcel of that would mean let's at first keep it from expanding. So former Northern Whigs, abolitionists, and then finally, number three, free soilers. Remember, we said the free soilers wanted to ban slavery from the Mexican session, not because they're abolitionists, but because they think it's harmful for the average white American farmer or wage earning worker. Those three groups have totally different ideas, but they all share a common desire to prevent slavery from expanding. None of them support Kansas, Nebraska. None of them would have supported the repeal of the Missouri Compromise, and they come together in a new party, and that is the Republican Party. So if I were to ask you on quiz or exam, the coalition, the three groups that came together to form the Republican Party, what was the one thing they had in common? They wanted to prevent slavery from expanding. Don't say they all wanted to abolish slavery. Only one of the three groups that came together went that far at that time. Huh? Yeah, I'm sure we have to deal with in this class as we get into the 20th century. There are some major shifts in terms of um, political party allegiance and alliance and that kind of thing. We'll talk about that. Well, but. they were just so stupid back then. They kept going back and forth and back and forth. Like, is the only thing that people remember from school or the only thing that they teach you when you're younger is like, Abraham Lincoln got rid of slavery. Right. In the Civil War, it was like, they didn't like it up here, and they wanted it down here. Right. And there's nothing out west. And right. Then, and then they all lived happily ever after. But like, like they just like they went back and forth, and like there were so many little spats mm -hmm. between just like two people. Yeah, there's and always a Congress lot more nuance than what you guys get. In Con Congress just has to be like, I, we don't know how to, we don't know who to pick. Yeah. Who to agree with? Yeah. That's why I like seeing like stuff is going on now. I just like wonder what is what are the history books going to send us? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Like, it's gonna say we were all traumatized. Uh, oh, that's true. That's from true. from 2016 and forward. Yeah, I, I agree with so that. It was made up of free soilers and Whigs. Northern former Northern Whigs. That's Lincoln. I mean, it's not just Lincoln, but he would be the the key one. And then the um, abolitionists. That's a movement that's growing at that time, but was a relatively, I mean, uh, small movement. But it is important that they are now part of this Republican Party coalition. Uh, but one more thing on that before we move to the next slide. Remember what I said about, well, national parties are holding the country together. One of them just broke. One of them breaking apart at the time. 
now we have a sectional party. Obviously, if we're talking about free soilers, abolitionists, and former Northern Whigs, uh, there are no Southerners in this Republican Party coalition. It is a sectional Northern Party at its inception. And so what will happen if we were to ever get to the point where a sectional party had enough power or enough electoral college votes to actually command the presidency? That we will see. Yes? I have a couple questions to clarify things. Unless my notes are wrong from my previous history class, uh -huh. the, com the Compromise of 1850 was started and proposed by Henry Clay, mm -hmm. and it, I put that it was finished by Stephen Douglas. Mm -hmm. Was the Kansas-Nebraska Act, like it was its own act, but was it, like did it overlap or was it part of the Compromise of 1850? And that's why I mean I know you can't tell me why I wrote that but like is that how it happened like no there's no direct connection simply because 1850 dealt in terms of territory with there were some elements of it like the border of Texas uh, that were part of it uh, slavery in Washington DC was part of it but yeah for our purposes what we're looking at is the Mexican session Henry Clay was also the author of the Missouri Compromise. So when things were really tough and they had all this shit they needed to work out, Clay was the guy they went to. But also at that time, Douglas is the big mover and shaker in the Democratic Party. Obviously, he's going to have a hand in making sure they got the votes for Compromise of 1850. But uh, Kansas, Nebraska 54 was his brainchild as opposed to him coming in and working to get Clay's package passed. Kansas, Nebraska was Stephen Douglas's brainchild from the beginning, and he orchestrated its passage and everything because he's the big dog in the Democratic Party. So, um, uh, in, in terms of territory, Kansas, Nebraska dealt with Louisiana Purchase Territory, Compromise of 1850 deals. In, in terms of deciding the question of slavery in Western territories, it dealt exclusively with the Mexican session. And the DC thing was another thing I was going to bring up. Why? With all of the Western stuff during the 1850 Compromise, did they just decide to throw the DC thing in there? Like, how did that come to be part of it? They so were like, oh, also, like, by the way, like, we want to abolish slavery over there. There were, if you imagine, I mean, you know, from the Hamilton clip and talking about the Federalist era and Jefferson and Madison's uh, beefs with Hamilton, the Compromise was what? 1798 or whatever it was where they agreed to back some of Hamilton's policies but he agreed to build uh, the nation's capital essentially in Virginia in the south so at this time now there are members of Congress in fact there are senators who are not just opposed to slavery expanding like Lincoln there are abolitionists in the Senate, in the House, from the northern states who have to come down into the South to physically attend Congress and to see out before the nation's capital people in chains being marched to a slave market. And it was appalling and abhorrent to them. And so one of the slavery issues of that exact moment was getting a ban on at least the slave trade in D.C., if not slavery per se. And so they had that going on. There was the Texas border issue. There was the Mexican session issue. They were like, can we get Clay in here? Uh, Clay, can you take all of these different things that have something to do with slavery that people are really upset about and kind of make an omnibus bill that would at least give us some temporary relief on this? And so that was the thinking behind, you know, settling these the things that didn't directly have anything to do with each other other than it had something to do with slavery. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. My last thing, I'm sorry. The, the new Republican Party was like Northern Whigs. Free Soilers and Abolitionists. Northern Democrats. Some, yes. And then the opponents of the Kansas Nebraska Act. Yeah. And yeah. I have the Know Nothing Party. Yeah, that was a, a short-lived party, uh, right. the, the so-called American Party, where their slogan was, you know, I know nothing because it's like a secret party to be a part of. And yeah, they took in some of those folks as well. Okay. And they were nativists? Which just means like, yeah, they were, which just means like extreme white racist people? More or less. It means, above all, that you're anti-immigrant. They were super, super nativist, meaning the anti-immigrant okay. stance, yeah. That's it.
All right. So I'm just, I'm just, clear, I'm just clearing my brain fog. All good. No worries at all. Um, so that brings us to, we've already talked about Bleeding Kansas. Um, John Brown here, if we're talking about abolitionists, he was among the most fervent abolitionists of his day. A man, uh, I mean, quite simply willing to commit murder, uh, to, to engage in extreme violence on behalf of abolishing slavery. He's a, a white man, but a committed abolitionist in that way, who was a part of those events in Kansas that ended up leading to that you know, sort of low-grade territorial civil war. He is going to show back up here in just a minute. Uh, and then I mentioned that there are abolitionists uh, in Congress, not a great many of them, but some. One of them is a man named Charles Sumner from Massachusetts. Charles Sumner, at one time, steps up in the Senate to give a speech condemning the Kansas-Nebraska Act and condemning the violence that was occurring in Kansas as a result. Uh, he called that speech, I think, the, the crime against Kansas. And in it, he not only talks about the Kansas-Nebraska Act and how bad it was and, and blamed, of course, the pro-slavery people for all of the violence out in Kansas, and then he started talking about uh, members in the chamber that were slave owners. Started talking about his colleagues and impugning them as slave owners and saying at one point to, to one of them, you know, I know that you go home to your harlot slavery. Harlot being a whore, a prostitute, right? Uh, and, and so he's using, okay, uh, a harlot as a metaphor for the institution of slavery Everybody in that chamber would have also understood he's making a not so subtle suggestion that this person is one of those slave owners that has sexual relations with his female slave. And this would, of course, be a stain on his honor in his very own presence. And uh, Southern white men were real big on maintaining their honor. Um, and uh, word of this, this speech and this, this criticism, or to put it mildly, of this other senator reaches across the building to the chambers of the House of Representatives. It so happens that the senator in question had a nephew who was a member of the House who's big mad about it and who runs across and into the Senate chambers and takes a cane and beats Charles Sumner nearly to death. He survives. He'll be back, but uh, didn't, not doing very well for a while there. So his nephew beat the shit out Correct. Yes, that would be exactly how we would put it. Um, Preston Brooks is his name, if it matters, but uh, he, he beats the shit out of Sumner near to death on the actual floor of the United States Senate. And people start showing up to Congress armed with guns and knives because you didn't know who's going to come try to beat you or challenge you to a duel or God knows what. Um, so that's the situation in Congress. I mean, bloodshed in Congress, threats of continuing violence in Congress and the press, the newspapers have a little fun with it and call this Bleeding Sumner. And as is often, or not often I guess, as is sometimes the case here, the Supreme Court decides to weigh in. Uh, at times in its history, the court will take a, a very narrow, a case with a very narrow issue, something maybe you might say real specific, and make a very broad pronouncement about a much bigger issue. And that is certainly the case with the court's decision in Dred Scott versus Sanford. Dred Scott is pictured at bottom center. He was a man born enslaved, but who spent most of his adult life traveling with his owner or master through the free states of like Ohio and Wisconsin, where he got married and had children and so on. And when his master dies, he makes the plea in court that, hey, I've lived all these years under the laws of these, these free states where slavery has been abolished long since and you have a free wife and kids. And so, you know, ought I be able to obtain my freedom in some way? Um, ought I get some relief in court? And that decision makes it all the way up to the Supreme Court, which hands down this decision, which has three components. And they don't all concern Dred Scott himself. 
Um, and it, it, again, is an example of the court taking a, re a relatively narrow issue in terms of the actual claim, but making through the, you know, much bigger pronouncements. Number one, they say Dred Scott is a black man and therefore not a United States citizen. And that's big right out the gate. Court says if you're black, you're not an American citizen. That might not matter to people who are enslaved, but there are thousands of people in America at that time who were free people of color. And here the Supreme Court is just saying, well, you know, you're a black person, you're not a citizen. And then they said, well, Dred Scott, as part of this first component, they said, well, you're, you're black, not a citizen. You didn't have standing to sue. Meaning, if you're not a citizen, you can't file a lawsuit in a federal court. They could have stopped there, of course. If you say you have no standing, I mean, that's it. That's the end of the court here in the case. But they didn't because they want to make um, these broad pronouncements. Second component is, of course, dealing with Dred Scott himself, which says because you're a citizen and can't make this claim, um, we could throw this out, but let us decide your case on the merits anyway. Two is you were born in Missouri. Missouri is a slave state that determines your status forever. It doesn't matter where you travel to, how long you live there, and what you do. You're born in a slave state, you're always a slave. And then three is the most important one. Most important one coming up. Um, the Supreme Court decides to weigh in on the, the biggest issue of all, going back to the beginning of all this, and says, we feel like Congress does not have the constitutional authority to ban slavery in any of the Western territories. Congress does not have the authority to ban slavery in any of America's Western territories under the Constitution. The unorganized ones, or just in general? If any of uh, any territory either unorganized that would then be organized into capital T territories that would become states. Federal government can't in, in come into that process and say at any point, there can be no slavery here. That would be a violation of their constitutional authority vis-a-vis -vis American citizens. I want to pause there though and think about this. There are kind of two, two or three, I guess, maybe big takeaways. Um, one, where have we seen in this lecture in the past, going back 30-some years, that Congress did indeed pass a law which banned slavery from a portion of the Western territories? Missouri, Missouri Compromise, 3630 line. That was a ban on slavery that said if this unorganized territory becomes organized, it can't turn into slave states. But what happened to that portion of the Missouri Compromise? It got repealed by what? Kansas. The Kansas-Nebraska Act. What the court is doing here, and by the way, the Chief Justice is a rabid racist, and as is our other members of the court, they are putting their stamp of approval on the Kansas-Nebraska Act, saying Kansas-Nebraska Act was right to repeal the Missouri Compromise because that was unconstitutional, we feel. They're weighing in on this big hullabaloo about the Kansas-Nebraska Act using Dred Scott case to say, Kansas-Nebraska Act, good, seal of approval from U.S. Supreme Court, was right to repeal Missouri Compromise. <laughs> what was their constitutional thought process? What argument did they use? We're white, and we that in their in their hearts, you might say, but yet constitutionally speaking, remember John Calhoun, and I said it'll come back. It's back. They used Calhoun's argument going back to the Mexican session and said if Congress were to do that, it'd be a deprivation of slave owners' property rights without the due process of law, which is violative of the Fifth Amendment. So. Take it a couple steps further, because both sides, pro-slavery or pro-slavery is expansion, anti-slavery is expansion, or just anti-slavery, all sides, I should say, 
are beginning to think in sort of broad conspiratorial terms. If you are against slavery or just against its expansion, you might believe in what they began to call the slave power theory. And this is the idea that powerful, wealthy slave owners are getting people into positions of serious authority, like the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and using that authority to make America a 100% slaveholding republic. Think about what is the what might be the ultimate uh, result of, of this line of thinking. Like, if you can make that argument for, you know, California or New Mexico or Kansas or Nebraska because John Calhoun or whoever wants to take their slaves there, how much of a stretch is it to say, well, what if John Calhoun wants to take his slaves to Massachusetts or New York? And when, and when are we going to reach the point where they make the argument that you can take slaves and live with them anywhere? And to make America just a, a slave-holding republic from north, south, east to west. And that this is what they've been trying to do all along. And this Dred Scott decision just um, makes them feel like they're correct. In that. You said slave power theory? Yes. That people with power who owned slaves were using their positions of power to... Make slavery legal everywhere in America. Okay. Yep. Yep. Now, we're going to see that kind of thinking, though, this sort of almost existential conspiratorial thinking on the other side as well. And for that, we might thank John Brown. Um, John Brown reemerges from Kansas a couple years later in Harper's Ferry, Virginia. He was such a committed abolitionist that he was aiming to seize an arsenal, a fort filled with guns and ammunition at Harper's Ferry to take his men and use those weapons to go plantation to plantation, freeing slaves to also use those guns and to build a slave army and go about uh, killing white plantation owners and growing that army in quite literally having a slave revolution in the South. Which, if it sounded or sounds now far-fetched, there had been a successful slave revolution in Haiti. Um, there had been a couple of times in American history up to this point where people had attempted this kind of thing and it looked like you know, it got to a point where it might have been successful but was not, meaning it wasn't just like a, an utter failure from the start. That being said, it was not successful. They, were, they did seize the arsenal, but they never made it out. Um, the, their group, the U.S. Marines are dispatched from nearby and ultimately uh, take Brown and the other leaders captive. Brown is uh, executed for his role in this and made a martyr for the abolitionist cause, a man who's willing to die for his position of wanting to destroy the institution of slavery. But think about this, right? If you're a white Southern slave owner, this man has come into the South and tried to make real your darkest fear, a slave uprising that would see you and your family killed and your whole institution uh, ruined. And remember, Brown is an abolitionist and therefore he is associated with which political party? So you have now someone associated with the Republican Party that is trying to kill you. What's going to happen when that sectional party actually has the electoral votes to not win a single U.S. state, Nicholas, and get Abraham Lincoln elected to the presidency of the United States? That is going to be the first thing that will cause uh, some of the slave states to secede from the United States and to form the Confederate States of America. We'll hash that out at the beginning of next lecture. Are there any questions? Uh, just, be, just because I was finishing writing down the slave power thing, yeah. I missed the beginning of the Harper's Ferry. Slave revolution in Virginia, yeah, yeah. But John Brown um, emerges there with a small group of armed men. They actually seize the fort. Like slaves. 
I don't know. I think initially, no. Their goal was to take their group and to go plantation to plantation, and then having the freeing the slaves and having them join. I don't know that there were any slaves or former slaves actually in his initial group or not. But and what was the thing that you said about the arsenal? Where did they go? The fort is an arsenal. So the, the purpose oh, okay. of the, oh, okay. the fort oh, is to, okay. to um, house guns and ammunition. And obviously that's a target because you then take those guns and uh, give them to slaves as you free them and grow your army. They just, um, it was not planned out well enough to succeed for them to actually make it out of the arsenal and they end up getting captured. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, this thing is from a uh, far back. I knew the beginning, but I was going to right. um, What was uh, the two provisions for the Louisiana Purchase? I have one about the line for the resort, but I didn't get the other. The first is just uh, Missouri comes in as a slave state and Maine comes in as a free state. Oh. Yeah, that was just the sort of uh, point of departure. Uh, and obviously that's never undone, but um, that second provision with the 3630 ban on slavery in the Louisiana Purchase north of that line, that stood for 34 years until it was repealed by Kansas, Nebraska, which the court in Dred Scott says was constitutionally for them the right thing to do. Do you know that Harriet Tubman was um, involved in the Parker's Grand Rate to suppose the house and it did not end up happening? That's why it kind of did. Yeah, uh, she had Harriet Tubman, who was part of the, the so called Underground Railroad, which is not actually a railroad, but a network of getting um, enslaved people out and uh, trying to, to foster them or hide them in places like Pennsylvania where they wouldn't get kidnapped back into slavery. But uh, she was, they, they, they called her Moses, and she was a badass and would do a lot of the well, actual legwork, which would include, uh, you know, being armed a lot, right? And, uh, or working with, uh, you know, John Brown in this crazy attempt to start a revolution. My favorite thing about that is you could uh, make the case that, uh, Harry, Harry Tubman was among the first gun toting Republican. She was a girl boss. She was. Yes. <laughs> what else? Um, now the South Associated Air Republican Party means what? Say it one more time. The South Associated Air Republican Party means Well, remember, it's you know, we, we, we noted that it's a, a whole bunch of different people from different backgrounds, but the big, the big three are Northern Whigs, Free Soilers, and Abolitionists. So that you can make in the Southern white slave only mind, you're like, this guy's an abolitionist. He's trying to kill me in a slave revolution. The abolitionists are part of the Republican Party. Republican Party just got a guy like the president. You see, you connect these dots, and you're like, well, this is going to ruin everything. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Anything else? Anything to add? No. Okay. No. Well, in that case, um, the next thing we'll do is Wednesday will be review for quiz two. Um, so you might, if you have time, read the documents before that. But uh, otherwise, um, that quiz will open that day and remain open through the weekend. And uh, yeah, that's where we'll go. And I'll hopefully I'll record our review so I can provide it for the online uh, folks as well.